Hello again and welcome to Backyard Farmer. I'm Kim Todd. I'll be your host for the next hour of good gardening advice. If you've got a problem in your lawn or your garden, we've got the answers and you can get in touch with us by dialing 472-1212 if you live in Lincoln. Our toll free number is 800-676-5446. We can also take your questions and pictures by email for a future show at byf at unl.edu. Please attach those pictures as JPEGs. Give us as much information as you can, including where you live. You can get additional information during the week from our social media offerings. That would be Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Pinterest. So let's look at samples and what is in the box, Oh, Jody? okay, so I have a lot of little tiny bagworm caterpillars. And so I know I brought um, a bag last month but it's too late to pick those off right now because they have emerged and people don't believe me. So I brought in some samples because they are very, very tiny. Um, so right now they're about a quarter of an inch long and you're gonna want to treat, uh, least toxic is gonna be BT and you're gonna wanna do like a full coverage of the plant so that it will get the caterpillars. And because um, there are some caterpillars that we do want around, I would say for evergreen trees, this is what's gonna be most important. Um, because they will land on everything and I've seen them on onions, I've seen them on uh, sweet potatoes. They kind of just go with the wind and they will start defoliating whatever they can get to because they're caterpillars, so they're very hungry. Um, but that's uh, something you're gonna want to look for. You kind of have to stand there and stare at the tree for a very long time. So they have hatched. I know um, people that have uh, windbreaks are very interested in knowing, so it is time to treat. Perfect, and they really, look at them just crawling around in Oh there. yeah. They're, they're just awful. <laughs> they're just awful. They're like little tiny ice cream cones. <laughs> there you go. They're alive. <laughs> Not tasty. <laughs> okay, Bill, you keep bringing things that look like weapons. <laughs> I know, and this one's heavy. Um, this is something that's kind of cool, I think at least, and this is my reason to buy it for my own lawn. It's like, oh, I'll bring it on the show. Um, if you ever wondered how they get stripes in you know, baseball fields and golf courses, part of that is sometimes they use those real mowers that you might imagine your grandparents using, but then the important things at the back, there's a roller. And so you can actually buy something like this that's just a big roller. Uh, this one's filled with sand and uh, you just attach it to the back of your mower, um, and then as you mow, it pushes the grass down. And so as you are mowing, the grass that you're mowing toward or into has kind of a lighter appearance because you're seeing the shiny tops of the leaves, and then if you look the, the other way, you turn around and it looks kind of like darker, that's because now you're seeing all the shade from uh, the other leaves shading each other, so it looks darker. And so, you know, it's just a simple thing. There's different brands out there. You just attach it to your mower. A lot of them are universal, so they work on different mowers. You know, really work well for big lawns. My backyard works really great. Uh, if you have a smaller yard, I would probably not think about getting this because hard to maneuver around, you know, the beds and the trees. But if you have big, big areas, it's kind of nice. It also kind of presses some of the ground down, doesn't really compact it. And um, yeah, so if you want that kind of baseball appearance, um, you know, this is one thing that you can do to add to your mower. <laughs> Fun. All right, so Kyle, you have bee balm. I have bee balm and you know, we had a lot of rain early on and now it's warmed up a little bit and so there's plenty of humidity, especially in these, in these fairly dense planted flower patches that we have. And here we have bee balm with powdery mildew. And so powdery mildew is one of, our, one of those pretty showy fungi, um, fungal pathogens that we have. But they just show up as these white superficial um, splotches kind of. Normally they'll be on the top part of the leaf and if you try, you can typically kind of rub them off a little bit as well. Um, and not always, apparently. <laughs> but sometimes you can, you can kind of rub these off. Um, big thing uh, though is whenever you do see a lot of CMC see powdery mildew come in, that is just a sign that the leaves have, are being wet for too long. So instead of doing some sort of chemical control, really maybe think about pruning them out, um, pruning a few of those to increase airflow. Or if you'd want, um, you can just manage your water a little bit better as well and make sure that you're watering from the base as, as opposed to that overhead watering. And then just kind of watch these little white blotches expand until the end of the season. Perfect. Or with that one, you can get 
a variety that is mildew resistant. Yes, mm -hmm. the host resistance is always the, the best way to control any disease. Says the rots and spots Says guy. the rots and spots guy. <laughs> All right, Sarah, you have interesting sorts of things. Yeah, so Jody's talking about bagworms tonight, and we know as people are out there looking at their trees, they're getting concerned, thinking that they're seeing bagworms in their trees when in a lot of cases they're not. So what we're looking at here are the natural cone structures on a couple of different types of trees. This happens to be a spruce, and you can see the cones that, that hang down from the underside of the branch, and they're just kind of a green, oval-pointed structure. This is not a bagworm. Uh, and, and honestly, if a bag is green like this, it's not bagworm, because by the time they attach it to their, their bag, the tissue is dead, and so it's usually brown, okay? So this is a natural cone. This is a natural cone. Um, and our spruces have fruited very heavily this year. I mean, or maybe I should say bloomed. So there are some trees that are just covered, especially the upper branches in these cones. There's just a tremendous number of them, but they're all natural structures. Another thing that people are confusing with bagworms are these pollen structures. These are the male pollen structures on a spruce tree. If I turn it that way, you can see it better. Um, so these are, again, these are natural. These are not bagworms. And here are the natural pollen structures on a pine tree, okay? So none of these things are bagworms, and you, you don't need to do any type of spray if you see these on your tree. And they're not rots and spots. And they're not a disease, that's right. Mm -hmm. So there you go. So enjoy, because we hardly ever see this kind of amazing cone Yeah, coneness. tremendous cone production this yeah. year. Yeah, it's just fabulous. All right, Jody, you get uh, the first series of pictures, which are one ABC on what are these? The first one is actually from Shenandoah, Iowa. Found these digging, what will they become? So what's that one? <clears throat> okay, that is the pupa of a green June beetle. Okay. So the big uh, green, green ones. All right, your second one is from Grand Island. Found this digging in the flower bed. That's the pinky finger, so we can see how big it is. It's hollow, so she's wondering yeah. what it was. So I guess these are a series of pupa. So this is uh, the pupal case of a hornworm. Uh, it would be a caterpillar and then it would turn into, so out of this came uh, a large brown moth, probably a sphinx moth of some kind. Mm -hmm. um, and we've had them on previous shows. All right. So um, yeah, they pupate in the ground, so. All right, and the third one comes to us from Greeley, Colorado. Um, I, I believe this is the same as the last one. If that, it looks like there's soil and dirt around it and a pretty big coin there. So I would say that's also a, a hornworm pupil case. So those beautiful sphinx moths turn into those nasty hornworms that attack our tomatoes. Reverse, but yes. Yeah. So they're going to be out <laughs> we go, right, laying, right. laying the eggs right. and uh, just ready to attack the tomatoes. So Okay, perfect. <laughs> All right, so Bill, you have a, uh, a question from Auburn. Mm -hmm. Is this a weed or a grass? Well, it is a grass, and it could be a weed if you don't want it there, right? So, okay, so <laughs> and uh, she sent two pictures here. So yeah, this this is one actually that kind of had us surprised. This is something that we might expect to see in Southern California um, or in Florida. Um, it's definitely a warm choosing grass, and we think it's common Bermuda grass. There was one variety that was had really thick stolons like this. These are the stems moving across the soil. Uh, usually you don't see stems quite this thick unless you're seeing something like a St. Augustine grass or Kikuyu grass in California. So that was kind of a surprise for us, but based on doing some consultation with other professors, we all kind of think it could be Bermuda, but for best diagnosis, probably a sample would be best. All right, and if it is Bermuda, is that okay or not? If you want grass there, I mean, it's going to grow aggressively in the summertime, and then it's going to die likely in the winter, but not all the way. And then some of it will come back, and then it, then it has that weedy characteristic because it's not a perfect lawn, and it, you know, but some of it comes back every year. All right, and so your third one here is um, this grass intertwined with others in the turf. Yeah, this hard to see from the picture. We zoom in a little bit. Um, some kind of hints here. Uh, Mid-rib is pretty prominent, uh, folded vernation, and just based on how it looks, most likely just Kentucky bluegrass, uh, maybe a different cultivar than they may have had uh, in their landscape. It looks a little bit different, but based on the morphological cues, uh, we're thinking bluegrass. But again, a sample, maybe it's a different uh, bluegrass. It's just hard to tell from that one picture. All right, thanks, Bill. Mm -hmm. All right, Kyle, you have a viewer who has a 35-plus-year-old John Red apple. Ooh. 
One main limb is looking dead. She's saying she thinks it's cankers, and she sent another picture that's a close-up. Had leaves and apples earlier on that branch, and she's, they, they think they need to remove it, certainly that limb, and then is there anything they can do? So what do we think this is? That's an old apple tree. That's a very old apple tree. Um, and really does look like look like a canker. Um, I think they had mentioned that had been seeing it for a couple of years now, so it has it has been there for a little while. You can tr depending on how far how how close that canker is to the main trunk will really guide a lot of your a lot of your management. Um, how if there's seems to be a bat, a good foot or so between the canker and the main trunk, you can try to just prune that um, prune that dead branch off and hopefully you'll have removed all of the pathogen as well. However, if the canker is right up against the trunk, kind of like the picture showed, not a whole lot that you can do. Um, so you might want to start thinking about a, a replacement tree in that area, un unfortunately. All right, and I think you have a third picture, which is pears. Um, yeah. This is southwest of Wahoo, and she has a lot of fruit trees, all the pears, but only the pears mm -hmm. are doing that. Yes. She said it's getting worse because we sent a follow-up email. Okay. Well, if it's getting worse, you know, whenever I see see leaf curling, especially in a um, kind of in a rural area, we tend to think of herbicide injury or something like that. But if it is getting worse and it's only affecting one type of tree, only her pears, maybe it is one, one, a disease. Um, so fire blight is one of our pretty common um, diseases of, of a lot of our fruit trees, and it can cause those leaves to curl a little bit. So I would start looking to see if you're seeing, um, noticing any black, um, any shoot dieback and where the shoots are turning black, or if the any of the blossoms are turning black. And that's a very characteristic sign of fire blight. All right, and that's it. And prune it out. That's a prune it out, yeah. and you can do, um, you can't just prune out those individual branches that are affected, but again, you'll wanna make sure that you're pruning a good six, six inches, if not a whole foot down past where you're seeing that the, um, the, the injury just so you're getting rid of that entire pathogen. All right, thanks, Kyle. Sarah, you have a couple different viewers that have rhubarb problems. Mm -hmm. uh, your first picture here is Southwest York. Uh, nearly every rhubarb plant in the row has some leaves with this issue. Stems are spindly, only about 18 inches, gets full sun. She's harvested only about 10 pounds, which sounds like a lot to me, but from a 20-foot row. She's afraid to pull any more up. She wonders how to help this patch and is asking if we say sanitation, explain what we mean by that. So that's your first one on rhubarb. So this leaf in the picture here does have a disease problem. Yeah. It has a, a fungal infection. And yep. I yeah, um, you know, there are a few different fungal leaf spots that rhubarb can get. Um, Ascochyta and Cercospora are the two main ones. We kind of think that this one is Ascochyta, but control for them will be fairly similar. So you can remove them and then sanitation, everyone's favorite word. Right, right. <laughs> so the question I would have for this viewer is how old is this planting? I mean, yeah. if these rhubarb plants have been in place for, you know, 25, 30 years, and, which is not unheard of in a rhubarb planting, it could be that they're just getting old and they need to be dug up and they need to be divided and replanted and kind of rejuvenate the planting. So that could be a, a, a definite cause for the, the small stems that you're getting. The other thing could be if you have done that recently, you have replanted, you may have replanted the crowns too deep. Mm -hmm. And that can also affect uh, the plants in that you'll see that the, the stems will be really thin and skinny and they won't get nice and thick the way that you're expecting. So, you know, uh, that might help you determine what might be the problem uh, with your planting there. Um, I've also noticed when I've had rhubarb in a location where the soil is staying really wet, they, they do tend to develop a root rot, which can also result in thin stems like that. So think about mm -hmm. those things. Okay, good. And you actually, your second one might be just that because you've got a couple pictures here that were yeah. transplants. She says the, the real issue is they look like this and she then waters them every single day. Right, so watering every single day is way too much for rhubarb, especially considering all the rain we've been getting this spring. Yeah. Um, and so if you had just replanted them, you may have ended up putting the crown a little too deep in the soil. So what I would do at this point, especially since temperatures are still fairly moderate now, is dig it up, lift it up, so that the, the crown is just below the soil surface, and then um, see how it does for the rest of the year. So I would back off on the watering so that you're watering it really deep when you do water, uh, and then only doing that Maybe maybe once every five to six days after you, you transplant it again, 
but then backing off on that gradually so that you're doing it no more than maybe um, once every 10 to 14 days. That would be, if we have no rain at all and we're under dry conditions, that would be what you would normally do with rhubarb. All right, thanks, Sarah. <clears throat> well, you know, we've talked about the benefits of planting oak trees several times on our show. If you've got a mature oak tree, you already know that they are really easy to care for. They offer a vast amount of shade and beauty to your home. Unfortunately, occasionally they do get rots and spots and insect problems that you have to keep an eye out for. So here's Kyle to talk about at least a part of that. Well, as summer is finally upon us, our oak trees are really starting to grow and leaf out to be these beautiful shade trees that we all love. Unfortunately, there are a few diseases that we've been seeing show up on our oak trees. And so some of the early season diseases that, we'll, that we've been seeing are anthracnose and oak leaf blister. Oak leaf blister looks very similar to a lot of our insects that form leaf galls. However, if you flip that leaf over and look on the bottom of it, you'll actually notice that it's hollow on the underside. This oak leaf blister is actually caused by a fungal pathogen, Tafrina. And anthracnose is another one of our early season foliar fungal diseases. Similar to oak leaf blister, these, both of these fungal diseases are favored by cool, wet springs, which we've had. One of the symptoms of anthracnose is you'll see dark discoloration that really tends to follow those leaf veins. As far as control for both of these fungal pathogens, in a landscape, we rarely recommend needing any sort of chemical control and because most of these just form some sort of cosmetic damage, a little bit unsightly, but don't impact the overall health of, health of the tree. So if you would really like, you can go ahead and do some pruning to get rid of those, get rid of those affected branches. But the big thing would be making sure that you're raking up a lot of the leaves in the fall that are affected and taking care of that sanitation that we always talk so much about. The more leaves you remove, the, the less inoculum there will be next spring. And so even if we have another cool, wet spring, hopefully we won't be seeing some of these same fungal diseases show up. And as we're watching the our oaks leaf out as the season goes on, maybe we're noticing that there are some branches that are pretty bare. Our, some of our oaks can get a few different vascular wilts. Verticillium wilt is one of them. The other diseases, wilt diseases that oaks can get are oak wilt, and then one that can often be confused for that is bur oak blight. But any time that you have entire branches that are bare right next to branches that have nice green tissue, nice green leaves on them, that's a sign that there is something a little bit further back going on. And so maybe you can follow that branch back and you'll see some sort of canker or a localized le sunken lesion on the wood that's restricting that nutrient flow. If you're not seeing a canker, then we should really need to be worried about some of these vascular wilts. Management of some of these wilt diseases can be very difficult, especially when we're looking at a tree as large as one of our oaks. Maybe we're not able to go back and trace that branch back and see if there is a canker there. So you maybe just want to start monitoring that before it falls on its own. If you start noticing an entire side of the tree that doesn't leaf out in the spring or leaves, loses its leaves really much earlier in the fall, again, this is another sign that we may be dealing with one of our vascular wilt diseases. And unfortunately, the best control for those is often pruning at ground level. So if you are seeing a tree similar to this one where we are seeing a lot of dead branches on one side, now is when you'll want to start thinking about maybe putting some sort of replacement tree nearby and waiting for this one to decline, but you have that replacement tree ready to go. And so in five, 10 years, you won't lose that shade that you love. You know, it's easy to sort of be complacent about those oaks. They take care of themselves. It really does pay to scout around those trees for diseases. Take that action when you can. Keep your feet on the ground, however, and if you need to do that pruning, let the professionals handle that big stuff. So even at the ground, Kyle, as you said, it's... yeah, don't, don't get out there with that chainsaw without. That's <laughs> gonna lead to some heartache for everyone, I or, think. Or other aches. Yeah, mm -hmm. death. <laughs> All right, so Caterpillar, 
This is uh, near Raymond and it's on daylilies. So that's your first picture on that one. So what do you think that caterpillar is, Jody? Um, this looks like a variegated cutworm. They, they'll eat pretty much anything, but I would just pick it off and throw it in the yard for a bird to eat. Perfect. There's usually just one at a time on each thing, but they can be pretty damaging. Okay, so then we have a rural Oto County viewer that has a plethora <laughs> on Rudbeckia. So what are these? Yeah, so this is the silvery checker spot caterpillar. So <clears throat> they feed like within a group. So they're very, they like doing this, but they are very beautiful butterflies. And it sometimes, um, what was that flower? Coreopsis. Mm -hmm. I saw some uh, adults actually mating. So there will be more caterpillars. And I think if you've got enough Rudbeckia, then I would say let them eat. The, it's very a uh, short amount of time and they turn into beautiful butterflies. So pollinators, National Pollinator Week. Happy, happy National Pollinator Week. <laughs> All right, thanks Jody. Okay, Bill, since you love weeds, here are yeah. a couple and really, <laughs> 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 they're coming to you uh, because, you know, we have some concern about weeds that are sort of in waste areas or on yeah. acreages seeding themselves about or into lawns. Yeah. The first one here, um, this is actually Northwest Iowa, and she hasn't seen any mature ones yet. They pull easily, they're not prickly. What do, you, what do we yeah, think? Yeah, we looked it up, because they're so young, it's hard to get a real definitive diagnosis or identification, yeah. excuse me. Um, we think it's some kind of an amaranth though. Um, and those are ones that like kind of plots, you know, our old plots used to be a farm field. And so right. you just start mowing them and they go away. So I'm not super worried about on a lawn to have you know, a plant like this who's you know, growing from the top. Uh, you mow it and it's, it's not gonna be able to, to handle that, uh, fortunately. So one of the benefits of mowing is weed control for sure. Okay, and then your second one is actually um, thistle growth in a cedar windbreak wants yep. to control the thistles without hurting anything else. Yeah, it's gonna be, tough um, depending on how close it is to the trees you know what, generally when you're trying to control thistle you want to you're gonna need to use something that has a couple different active ingredients in it um, and then you can get pretty good control um, but you'll be careful with drift the things that have like dicamba you know it might you know in injure some of the uh, the, the windbreak possibly um, and so just be kind of careful with that and when you're spraying it just try to keep it right around the, the uh, thistle plant so you're not you know spraying willy-nilly and, and you should be able to control it as long as you're being precise in your applications. All right, thanks, Bill. All right, the header on this one is, is it a goner, Kyle? Oh, boy. <laughs> so this is a five-year-old cherry tree. The problem started at the top, worked its way down quickly. Uh, none of the other trees in the orchard look that way. This is rural Oto County again. Yeah, um, unfortunately, just kind of really looking at how the all the leaves are wilted, um, still attached, but the leaves look pretty crispy. That tells me that there's no there, there's no water and no 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 water and no nutrient flow going on in, in that tree. So it's likely it likely may may be a goner. Um, and so the other thing that I was noticing though, especially on that second picture that shows the that shows the the trunk more, it does seem like there's a little bit of kind of orange goo coming out of the coming out of the trunk mm -hmm. and that orange goo is it can be back uh, can be fire blight and so fire blight is a bacterial pathogen and it will actually kind of ooze out of those cankers on occasion and if so if you did want to try to save this tree I don't really don't think you'd be able to um, but using a, a copper product does work for fire blight control. However, I really think you're gonna be best with this one, just planting something else. All right, thank you, Kyle. Sarah, you have three pictures here. Your first is a Shelton viewer. She has a picture of a strawberry and just she thinks her strawberries are the best they've ever been. Why did that one turn out looking like that? Flowers do strange things sometimes, and sometimes you'll get flowers that'll fuse at the base or, or cause some sort of deformity like that. So it's just, it's just an oddity, just a, a weird thing that the flowers have done. <laughs> <laughs> and your second one is actually, it could be either you or Kyle, and uh, this is the stra strawberries on the west facing side of his strawberry bed look like this, shade in the evening. Some of the ripening fruit is a little blotchy. He wonders, is this sun scald, uneven ripening, or rots and spots? I think most likely this is a, 
uh, a weather burn. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you look really closely at some of the caps on some of those strawberries, and you can see the beginnings of gray mold, uh, botrytis. But I think, but the fruits themselves don't appear to be infected. So I think, and, and a weather burn is is just um, when the the fruits are suddenly exposed to uh, a lot of um, sun or or hotter conditions. So if you've had um, a storm move through your area that has pushed the foliage off to one side and left the strawberries exposed suddenly, it could result in something like this. Um, so I, I'm thinking that that's probably what it is. It's just sort of a, a weather-related abiotic sort of condition. And unfortunately, there's not going to be much they can do about it unless they want to go out in the, and try to pull the foliage back over the strawberries so that they're shaded and see if the rest will ripen properly. All right, and your third one here is um, Concord grapes in Humphrey. Mm -hmm. They were full, and then they've kind of dropped a few of the grapes. What do we think there? So if the little little immature grapes are falling, there could be a few different reasons for that. Um, nitrogen fertilizer could be one. If the, if the vines were fertilized really heavily, that can uh, cause a lot of vegetative growth at the expense of fruit production, so you could get some flower or some fruit abortion. Um, and then the other, the other extreme is also a factor. So if the plants are really nutrient deficiency, you could also get some fruits dropping too. Um, or it could just be a straight up pollination issue where you just had um, uh, either not enough insects moving the pollen or we got some cold temperatures during pollination and the flowers died and so the fruits are falling now. So it could be any of those things. All right, thanks Sarah. Well, you know, we have pretty much everything planted out in the garden. Do not forget, we have several containers that are really a lot of fun during the growing season. Here's Terry James to show us what's happening in the containers at our backyard farmer garden. This week in the backyard farmer garden, we're do doing a little tender loving care with our containers. Remember when we said we planted our containers, used really good potting mix, and we put a slow release fertilizer in there. With all of this rain, we're kind of a little bit of concern of some of those nutrients. So we're gonna side dress those uh, pots and our raised beds to make sure they have good nutrients for the rest of the summer with another uh, application of slow release fertilizer. Plus, this time of year, we're gonna start giving them um, an overhead with a liquid fertilizer about every two to three weeks, just to kind of keep them going, get them through this hot part of the summer and make sure that all of our containers are looking good. As we're watering, we're doing a little pinching back, making sure that they're good branching on all of our annuals in our containers and they're looking really good. We're starting to harvest some of our vegetables. Make sure that you stop by on Tuesday nights and bring your extra produce to the backyard farmer garden. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden this week and check out what's growing. Our garden looks just fabulous already, including all those things growing in the containers. You can visit us any single day, but on Tuesdays, bring your extra produce, and that is really a good donation program. All right, Jody, how do buffalo gnats get controlled? Hmm. Well, that one's difficult because they are pretty strong flyers and they're outside, but... Um, <laughs> A little bit different than mosquitoes because they like running water, so they are also aquatic, um, the, the, where they lay their eggs and, and their larvae. So um, if, if they're biting you, it's gonna be, you know, I guess personal, like protection and loose clothing, stay covered up. Um, some repellents will work against biting flies, but yeah, there's, there's a lot of biting things out there right now. Sorry. All right. <laughs> yeah, not your fault, right? Okay, so Bill, um, we have, first we had questions about maple seedlings in lawn. Now uh -huh. we have people that are seeing oak seedlings in the lawn. How do they control the oaks in the lawn? Bring out the mower. Oh. Just mow them. The, the, you know, those, those plants are growing from the top. You mow them off. They can't handle the defoliation, and then you don't have any oak problems anymore. They don't, <laughs> usually, lawn mowers usually win, so. <laughs> right. Okay, Plus so. big oak. It's, yeah. Well, even then, you know, that mower blight. That's true. <laughs> All right. So, Kyle, can you give the hours and the address for the diagnostic clinic? Because people keep asking us and be great to have it on air. Oh, yeah, it makes perfect sense. So we are open really from 8 a.m. until about 5 p.m. Um, 
seven, uh, five days a week. Um, the address is 18, 1875 North 38th Street is the, the Google Maps address. Otherwise, if you are familiar on, with campus, um, it's 448 Plant Science Hall. All right. Excellent. That was an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah, this is a Wilbur viewer who had marigolds that apparently have reseeded themselves, as they will, but they didn't come up this year. Any ideas on that one? Hmm. That, that is odd. You would think if you had volunteers one year that they would keep reseeding themselves. So um, I'm not sure I have a good answer for that, unless it's just been too wet uh, and the seedlings have died. Or you put a pre-emergent down and forgot about it, and that would have killed the same thing. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm grasping. I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. No good reason for that one, yeah. probably. Not your day to be queen. Yeah. Round, who has decided they're going to win? Kyle. Me. <laughs> yeah, no. So. All right, Sarah, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, we've had two viewers ask how they can kill the sprouts from tree stumps. One was ash, and the other was elm. There's no way to do it. <laughs> All right, Bennington. This says the Bennington viewer. They want to know whether you can use pressure-treated lumber for raised beds. You can if it's the newer types that, that use copper as the treatment, not not the old arsenic products, which actually aren't on the market anymore anyway. So. All right. Um, this is a viewer who has a two-year-old weeping willow that has a big vertical crack, like one-inch wide vertical crack. She's wondering, is that tree a goner? That's a significant injury. What I would probably do if you want to keep the tree is try to prune one of those halves out so that eventually you're going to remove that and you'll, you'll, they'll let one half remain. But still, you have a big wound there. So you're going to have wood rot coming into that trunk. All right. This is a viewer who wants to know whether she can grow lilies from the little black seed-like things on the stem. Yes, you can. Take right. a couple years to get flowering, but you can. All right. Water set on rhubarb for three days in plain view. She knows she can't eat it, but she wants to smash it over. So it's like just lying on the ground. The no, don't do that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you, want, you want the plant to stand. I mean, the plant, even though you can't eat from it this year, you need the plant to stand so that it can photosynthesize and develop carbohydrates and you, you, you have the strength and the vigor in the crown for next year. So don't smash the stems. That's not a good idea. <laughs> I think you got a little worked up on that one. <laughs> like offended person. Like, oh, don't, hurt them. don't smash them. Okay. All right. Are you ready, Kyle? Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. this, this is a viewer in Springfield who has cedars and says the ends of the branches are turning brown, like just the ends of the branches. Could be a few things. We had a pretty severe winter, so winter injury is one of them. The other, uh, Phomopsis and Cercospora are two other um, diseases that will take out the ends of cedar tips. All right. Have you ever seen fire blight in a mulberry tree? No. All right. So we had a viewer say, we say sanitize the tools. Do, do we dip them? Do we wipe them? So yeah, there are a few things that you can do. Um, I like to walk around with, I'll have a, a bottle of 10% bleach solution and an old rag, and then we'll spray the, um, spray the rag and wipe down my, my prune equipment. All right, this is an Underwood viewer who has yellow spots on the green bean leaves. What is that? Uh, I would probably need to see a sample to tell for sure, but yellow spots on beans, I tend to think bacterial blight. All right. This is an Alliance viewer who wants to know whether the cedars can and should be treated for cedar apple rust now. It depends how, if you care more about your cedars than your apples, um, regardless the time to Time to control and time to treat or control is not right now. If you want to control your seed or want to save your cedars, you'll want to treat those in the fall. All right, excellent. You ready? Don't look at me like that. I'm all nervous now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making stuff up for you. Uh oh. All right. All right. This is uh, an Underwood viewer again okay. who has a very thick bladed grass and clumps in the lawn. How can they eliminate that without eliminating the rest of the lawn? Um, probably the best, best non-selective glove of death type of an approach, honestly. All right. It could be a, it could be a summer annual, but um, without an idea, I can't say anything else. Okay. Is it uh, is it too late to put down compost on the lawn, like top dress with compost? No. All right. And if so, how deep? Um, you know, 
as deep as the lawn can take. If you're mowing higher, you can put more down. It's gonna be great for the soil. You'll definitely do it. The hardest part is actually getting it spread evenly over your lawn, but if you can do it, try it. All right. Um, this is a Kearney viewer who is sodding right now after new construction. Sure. How often should they water? Great question. Water heavy at first to wet the soil below, then know that the sod is going to prevent that soil from drying out until the roots go into it. So then your subsequent watering a couple times a day is just to keep the sod wet. And then as soon as you can't pull that sod up anymore, you can start you know, doing deeper waterings less frequently, like once a day, twice a day, but not five times a day uh, you know, for four months. I see that way too much. <laughs> That was not a linear on question. <laughs> like, that, hit one, that hit one of my little, like, uh, really you know, I've seen like, It was a really great answer. Well, yeah. sod gets overwatered way too much, and I just, it yeah. drives me crazy. I want to pull my hair out. That was a good answer. I can see that. That was a good answer. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe you win for best answer, but yeah. not most <laughs> answers. <laughs> All right, form? Jody, are you ready? <laughs> yes. Mm. So uh, we have a viewer who knows, thinks they have leaf hoppers on their tomatoes. How do you control leaf hoppers on tomatoes? Hmm. Well, are they doing a lot of damage? Are they seeing a lot of speckling? Um, probably neem or something that, but it, I mean, it's gonna be like a treatment that's every like couple days. All right. So a, a, a McCook viewer wants to know, is there a safe control of small grasshoppers? Hmm, that's tough. I've got those too. I was looking that up today. There's some baits, but it's, it's really tough to control grasshoppers because they're so mobile. All right. Can a homeowner pour a solution around very large ash trees? This is a Henderson viewer, and this is for EAB. Um, I think that would have to depend on how big the diameter of the tree is. All right. Will a soapy water solution work for aphids on hollyhocks? Yeah, if you can get them on there, you can also spray them with hose. Okay, how do you control fruit flies in the house? Well, you can make a fruit fly trap. You wanna get rid of the fermenting fruit that is attracting them in the first place. But it's uh, apple cider vinegar in a little container. Funnel them in and catch them. So I think we're gonna to have to give Bill the best answer because I mean, everybody the, else got five. Can I get the award for first loser today? <laughs> yeah, Yay! first loser, yeah! It's my first time. Thank you to everybody for your support. <laughs> All right, Sarah, what, what are the plants of the week? <laughs> um, so, so this taller pink one in the front is called um, Jupiter's Beard or Red Valerian. Mm -hmm. And it's a really nice perennial uh, that does well in kind of difficult sites. So it will grow well in sand or um, just kind of poor soil without a lot of nutrients in it. Um, and it, it does very well. So um, tends usually gets around um, three three to five feet. I mean, it can be tall sometimes if it's in, in a more fer uh, fertile soil. But after it's done blooming, you can shear it back and then it will come back and you'll get a second bloom on it. So you can get a lot of color out of it during the, uh, during the growing season. So that's Jupiter's beard. The little one here in the front is actually a blackberry. So this is Chester's thornless blackberry. And you know, even though it is a fruit, it has really pretty light pink flowers. And um, uh, you know, fruits about this, well, fruits in July usually, that's when you'll be harvesting um, from the floral canes that it produces that year. So most of the blackberries do have thorns, and so that's one of the nice features about this particular one is that it is thornless. So you, you can get some ornamental benefit from it, and you also get some great fruits. Perfect. All right, thanks, there. And by the way, those are both out of the backyard farmer garden, so come visit. All right, Jody, you get the next set of pictures. Um, this is actually from the Keystone area in Omaha. It's an American elm that is 22 years old and is wondering what is the fuzzy white stuff on the leaves and what to do about it. Okay, this is actually caused by an aphid. And so it causes those leaves to roll up tight like that in their woolly aphids. So they've got all this like thick wax on them. So if you actually unroll them, it, you'll see these aphids in there. But um, they're, they're sap feeders, so. Um, I would like prune those off. Okay, all right, and your second one is white orbs on a thornless hawthorn tree. And this is Omaha also. Yeah, I've seen these a, a lot around Omaha actually. And so this is also an insect that feeds on sap and they produce a lot of honeydew actually. So if you're under there, it's very, very sticky, but these are hawthorn mealy bugs. Um, you can use insecticidal soap depending on how big the tree is and how many there are. Um, but uh, treating during the crawler stage is probably when you're gonna wanna do that. 
but, right. but that's an insect. All these odd insects. Yeah, it's very strange. Like they belong to Kyle instead. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Bill, um, this is a, actually a Lincoln viewer mm -hmm. who sent a picture and wonders what this is. And it has overtaken her lawn in central Lincoln. She thinks it's a sedge, um, sh minimal lawn care, so she really has not been watering. So what is this? Mm -hmm. Yep, this is um, Carex Brevior. Brevior? Brevior. Brevior, sorry. <laughs> but it's a, it's a sedge. And uh, yeah, and it's actually native, and so it's one of the native small sedges. And you, again, you can always identify them by rolling them through your fingers and feeling a little triangle stem. Um, you know, if you're not really doing lawn care there, it, you know, there's some options if you really want to get rid of them. Here's a sample actually from that lawn, so it's really great to to, to have this, so we can actually identify the uh, the plant. So thanks, Kim, for getting me this. Um, and you know, there, there are things that we can use to control sedge that would probably work on this selectively. Uh, we could always do a non-selective option. You know, most lawn care people have option uh, access to that if you really hated it. But at the same time, it is a native, so. Um, you know, if you really hate it, you can't control it. Otherwise, you could just try to appreciate the native plant in Nebraska. And anything that looks like turf and doesn't need much care is okay by me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> All right, so you have an ID of a beautiful thing first, Kyle. I think it's pretty. It, it is. So he, he, we don't know where he's from, but he says, what is this fungus among us? Yeah, um, we think that this is a oyster mushroom, a uh, pleurotus. Um, Typically with oyster mushrooms, you don't get as wavy of a margin, but it's been a really wet year, and so some of our some of our fungi are doing some some kind of strange things. All right, it's really pretty. It is. And then this next one is not so pretty for you. Um, this is uh, on her acorn squash. This dusty thing on the stems of her acorn squash wonders what caused it and what to do about it. Yeah, it uh, could, be, could be a few different, different things. There are a lot of kind of saprophytic fungi that will just grow, um, grow superficially on the, on the soil surface and on the leaf or and on the stems. There are also some white molds though that, that can come in as, as well and actually cause disease. So I really don't have a good answer for what it is, but if you can just try to dry out that bed a little bit, that will reduce the whatever the fungus is, so it will reduce its ability to grow. All right, thank you, Kyle. Sarah, your first two are actually from two different viewers. Um, not sure where the first one is from, but the second one is from Holdridge, mm -hmm. and they're the same plant, and they're simply wondering what they are. Mm -hmm. This is called Lizomachia punctata, called loose strife is the common name. And it, it's a nice perennial that just kind of creeps slowly and, and will make a nice, you know, kind of ground cover, a taller ground cover, I guess. And this is not the same as the Lysimachia that nope. is the nate. The yeah, nasty. we talk about loose stripe and yeah. people get confused, but right. of course, the noxious weed has purple flowers and it's much taller than this. Yeah. Um, so, different thing for common name. Mm -hmm. And your third one here is an, uh, somebody near Pawnee Lake mm -hmm. revamped the flower garden, pulled up dozens of those before they flowered, um, left a few, is wondering what this is. Mm -hmm. This is a campanula, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure exactly which species it is. It might be latifolia, but I'm not positive. But the campanulars are commonly called bell flower, and so this is an, also a nice perennial. It is. Excellent. Thanks, Sarah. You know, we've heard from John Porter this season on how to get your tomatoes going, choosing plants from the garden center, and for his third installment, John's got some tips on keeping the nasty rots and spots off of your growing plants. Here's John to tell us more. Well, I'm here in the garden and it's starting to rain a little bit. We've had a pretty rainy season here in Nebraska and that could lead to some health problems in our tomatoes and other plants because diseases love wet weather. We've been growing tomatoes from seed to plate here throughout the season on Backyard Farmer and today we're going to talk about some things that we can help reduce the likelihood of diseases with Integrated Pest Management or IPM. There are things that you can do to help reduce the diseases in your garden throughout the entire garden season. 
One of the biggest causes of diseases in tomatoes is wind splashed rain that's splashing the soil up on the plant and all of the diseases that could be in that soil. So the best thing to do is actually to mulch those tomatoes. So using something like these grass clippings here or straw or shredded newspaper can help keep that soil from splashing up on the tomatoes. When you're watering, you want to avoid getting water on the tomatoes as well. So if you're watering by hand with a hose, don't spray them, especially in the evening because it doesn't have time to dry and using something like drip irrigation would be great to avoid that as well if you can put that in there. Also one of the things about mulch is you want to get a good enough spread to avoid weeds. Weeds will be a good vector for a lot of diseases so you want to avoid stuff like this. You want to make sure you keep all those pulled well back from your tomatoes especially if you have them well mulched like this. So one of the most important things you can do for tomato health is have appropriate spacing to have airflow so the diseases don't land and germinate on the plants. For your bush type tomatoes, the determinants, you need a little bit more space, about two feet at a minimum. For the indeterminate tomatoes, the ones that are more vining and you grow upward, you can be a little bit closer on those. But speaking of which, you want to keep those tomatoes off of the ground. So using something like a cage or a stake will keep them up off of the soil where we can get some of those diseases. One other thing that you want to think about for airflow is the plant itself. Sometimes they get a little bit too bushy throughout the season. A lot of them grow what are called suckers, which are extra gross that come on the stems or between the stems. And you want to be able to prune that out. So you have to take a look at the plant and prune out. You can pinch out that extra growth to have better airflow in your tomato plants. Today we talked about trying to avoid some of the problems in our tomatoes by practicing integrated pest management. So we started out by picking the correct cultivars that are disease resistant, but then we talked about things we can do in the garden to help reduce diseases. We talked about mulching and watering. We talked about using the appropriate spacing in our plants to make sure they're not too close. We talked about using cages or stakes to keep them up off the ground, and we talked about pruning out those suckers to keep them healthy. Next time what we're going to talk about is managing those those diseases if we get them. Disease management is part of really good gardening. Using those tips will help you have the best chance of success for those luscious tomatoes on your BLTs. <laughs> so we'll hear from John next month about more tomato tips. All right, Jody, this is a Steinauer, Nebraska viewer, has a dwarf cherry tree planted this spring dark blue flying insect ate all the leaves off in a day. They'd watered it one day and the next day the leaves were all gone. Saw a few of them flying around half inch long. They make a buzzing sound. What is it? How do they control it? Okay, so that picture looks like a, a bee. So I don't think this is what has done damage to the cherry tree. That sounds like a massive like tent caterpillars or something that did that that fast. So I don't think this is the culprit. This is probably something trying to pollinate your plant. <laughs> right. <laughs> or so, feed. Yeah, so, so maybe yeah. that's one where we just can't help on this one too late. Right. All right, so this is a viewer that has a tiny little picture there, but she's wondering, they had a big hill of these ant-like creatures near their patio. They swarm around the light. Um, she doesn't know if they are dying flying ants or termites. These are definitely not termites. They are flying ants and actually the one that's more curled up is a, a female and the other one's a male. So they swarm to mate and start a new colony and they were not very successful. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe she smashed them. <laughs> They're going down the drain, it looks like. <laughs> All right. Bill, um, one of your favorites, a weed grass in Omaha, mm -hmm. but it is a grass. It's a grass. Um, it's a mystery weed, gr weedy grass. It's about three and a half feet tall already. Mm -hmm. It is creeping into the garden. She would like to know what it is and how do we eradicate it? Yeah, that would, it's, it's some type of a wheatgrass. Um, there's, different, there's different ones, but it's hard to tell from this picture. You can kind of tell from the seed head there, that panicle is, is pretty distinctive. Um, depending on the garden, you know, it's pretty big. So you're probably gonna need to try to pull it out and, uh, and just be persistent with it, non-selectives, maybe a grass be gone, maybe, I don't know, what do you think? 
I don't Probably know. not. Because it's wheat grass, not yeah. weed grass, right? Well, it's still uh, grass, so I didn't know if maybe that would work or not. I don't know a lot about killing grass, because it's usually my friend. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I would say he has to be really aggressive and persistent yeah. with it. Yeah, yeah, give it a dig first and then. Yeah, exactly. We need to get it under control a little bit. Three and a half yeah. feet, a little crazy. We need to bring it down, <laughs> and then we'll start trying some other things. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle, this is a, this is a Missouri Valley, Iowa viewer. Okay. Uh, she has she sent us some pictures of some hostas, and she is uh, wondering is this a disease? Um, those look exactly like my hostas, and I've tested them for a few different viruses because I was curious, and they all came back negative. So I think that might just be some of that natural it's odd like leaf it. characteristics that different hostas have. All right. All right, good on that one. And then your third one here, which is also hostas, this is from Carney. And five hostas were planted. Two of them began to look different than the others. They did this stocky thing. Yeah. They are trying to flower. What the heck? Yeah, this is not some of that natural variation in hostas. <laughs> um, I don't really know for sure what this is. Um, the guess, though, is that it's going to be uh, some sort of fasciation. And so that fasciation is just an abnormal, abnormal growth of tissue, often caused by, um, caused by flu extreme fluctuations in temperature and other weather conditions. And if Kearney area, it was pretty warm, then it got cold again, then it got hot, then it got cold, and then hot. And that will allow some of those uh, fasciation, fasciation events to occur. The fascination of the fasciation. The fascination <laughs> of the fasciation. All right, thanks, Kyle. All right, you get a weed question, Sarah, because um, this plant is doing really well in the flower bed. He doesn't mm -hmm. know whether this is let it go or rogue it out. Mm -hmm. So what do we think on this one? Yeah, so this would generally be considered a weed. Uh, it's called beggar's sticks, and it's in the genus Biddens. There's a couple of other weeds also in that same genus. Um, so you'll probably find this in wildflower books if you were to look for them, but generally it's considered a weed, so you probably want to get rid of it. Yeah, and I think I gave you the wrong. I said Spanish needles. Spanish needles one. is another Biddens, yeah. and, but it has a more ferny, finely cut leaf than this one uh, does. So. Yeah. Um, they have little barbs on their seeds, which you know can catch onto fur or clothing or fabric or things like that and move around. So, yep. Anyway, you probably want to get rid of it. All right, thanks, Sarah. Well, you know, we always do announcements of fun things in the gardening world, and right now we don't have a whole lot going out in the, on in the gardening world, but we do want to tell you again what the hours and the address are of the Plant and Pest Diagnostic Clinic because it's really hard for you to get samples to Kyle if you don't know where it is. It's and it's really hard for you to do it on Saturday because he won't be there and you can't get into the <laughs> building. <laughs> so the other announcement, of course, is do not forget to watch Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer. It is Sundays on our Facebook page. This week, we will be discussing the importance of pollinators with Extension Assistant, Assistant Mary Jane Froge and UNL entomologist Judy Wu Smart. So be sure to watch Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer on the Backyard Farmer or NET's Facebook page this Sunday, 6.30 Central. All right, <coughs> time for like hardly any questions. So this is semi-lightning round. Um, EAB treatment in Lincoln, Jody, is spraying an effective treatment for ash trees? That's gonna be a very complicated answer, but not necessarily spraying, but treatment can be, but you've gotta go through the process of evaluating your tree and then determining how big it is and which, I mean, it's effective, the treatment, if you're going to evaluate your tree and want that. All right, but just don't go off and buy a spray bottle. Yes. Gotcha. All right, how do we kill a weed <coughs> called Pennsylvania Pellatory, Bill? With our hands. <laughs> <laughs> you just pull them right out of the ground, like, rah, you know, and it, it kills it usually, so. Yeah, and it's annual. Okay. Yeah, good. That was a funny answer. <laughs> okay, so a 10 to 15-year-old peony in Lincoln, Kyle, the blooms turned brown in the bud stage and did not open. So are we, is this the beginning of a disease or is this potentially some environmental stuff? I would probably guess it's environmental. Um, got really cold uh, and we had, had some temperatures that were close to freezing and peonies are pretty, they are pretty susceptible to that, to that cold injury. So I would guess that it's just, um, yeah, they, they froze. All right, Sarah, real quick. 
a gallon of vinegar, two cups of Epsom salts, a quarter of a cup of Dawn Original Blue Dish Soap for fake Roundup? No, yeah. won't work. <laughs> I mean, there is research on using vinegar as a weed control, but not the stuff you buy in the stores. So this will not work. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> and that was good, guys.